at issue this week, the political year in review. Affordability dominated much of 2023. We are focused on affordability for Canadians. They're focused on picking fights. After eight years of Justin Trudeau, everything costs more. The Conservatives gained a lead in the polls and the Liberals announced a carbon tax exemption. There were also election wins, allegations of foreign interference, high profile visits, and resignations. All this as wars fueled global instability and division. So what were the political highs and lows of the year? I'm Rosemary Barton here to break it down in person, all together in Toronto, Chantal Bear, Andrew Coyne, and Althea Raj. Look at this. It's like old times, isn't it? It's wonderful to see you all in person. Okay, so this is, um, this is the one I like the most because I get your quick takes on things, important things. I'm going to start with one word to describe the year in politics and why, and you're up first, John. Uh, cranky. <laughs> I don't think I've ever seen <laughs> That's as... us or... <laughs> cranky and cranky. Um, I don't think I've ever seen a year where it was so tough to be an incumbent. Uh, and I don't just mean uh, federally. Yeah. That's true in the provinces, but it's true across the world. Look, Joe Biden, uh, Emmanuel Macron, uh, in the UK, the next election will probably bring change. And some of the change elections that we saw were, were change elections. Mm -hmm. They weren't about right or left mm -hmm. uh, or extreme right or uh, Poland went in one direction, yeah. etc. Uh, and the Netherlands in another. It's just people are angry and they're taking it out on incumbents. Okay, Andrew, your word. Uh, disintegration. Mm. Uh, so far, uh, this is very positive. <laughs> <laughs> so at home, we've had you know premiers running off, you know, rewriting the constitution unilaterally, vowing they're going to disobey the law, uh, running roughshod over the charter. Internationally, you've got a you know this ongoing accelerating it looks like breakdown in the international rules-based order. So disarray and disintegration there as well, uh, including on the economy where we're seeing the first signs of unraveling of the of the international globalized economy. I think we should be very worried about that. And then it, it more sort of atmospherically, a breakdown in consensus on issues that we thought we had a fair degree of unanimity. We're starting to see this on immigration, for example. Mm -hmm. uh, and of course, at the farthest extreme, uh, this accelerating breakdown in the, in the you know, fact-based society, the ability of democratic societies, not just in Canada, but everywhere, mm -hmm. uh, to actually argue from the same set of facts. Althea. I said partisan for all the reasons that both Rafael and Andrew have laid out. I think political parties have decided not to focus on the stuff that unites them, not that they usually do, but they have taken it to a different level. Yeah. And it's hyper-partisan. Everything has been politicized. Um, and you told me not to talk too much, so I'm going to end it there. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So we can get uh, through this I'm list. Sure, I'm, <laughs> sure, I'm sure she's going to catch up later. I can see money the in the biggest, bank. The biggest political win of the year. Coming to yeah, me, back I, to feel, I feel like the students sitting in the front row here. <laughs> oh, I'll just um, switch it up. Then. Okay, yeah. uh, I gave that to the NDP, the uh, federal NDP, for, the yeah. federal NDP for two reasons: the anti-scab legislation, which was uh, a pipe dream of not just the NDP but the Bloc Québécois for decades, yeah. mm. but also an expansion of Medicare into dental care. Those were two kind of dream things that the NDP kept talking about, <clears throat> and they never happened. I'm not passing judgment on whether they're good or yeah, bad, yeah. but they are big wins for, the NDP, for yeah. a fourth place party in the House of Commons. Althea. Daniel Smith. Yep. Uh, I think if you had asked us 18 months ago, uh, probably, I think maybe you may have asked us 18 <laughs> months ago, and we all said, well, the polls were suggesting Rachel Notley was going to win. But it's not just that she won and that she won a majority, but that she has changed the national conversation. And I'm not sure that we would be having the discussions the way we are discussing them were it not for her leadership. It has affected, obviously, Premier Mo's um, response, but I, I think it is also changing the consensus federally over certain things. And I think that that is going to change the conversation next year. You also chose a province. Yeah, the Manitoba NDP winning. Uh, um, not a huge surprise. The Conservative government there had long overstayed its welcome. Uh, but, you know, to have our first, uh, first Nations Premier of a province in the history of the country mm. uh, is pretty remarkable. He himself is a remarkable life story. Uh, when you consider the troubles he had as a young man, uh, and the maturity he is now showing and the uh, leadership he's showing, 
Uh, it's, it's a fantastic uh, um, breakthrough for the country, and I think it's something, you know, we all dwell a lot on the negative news. That's a pretty positive, good news story. Okay, biggest political surprise of the year. Althea, you start us off on that one. The takedown of David Johnston. Um, so the conservatives used to trumpet their appointment of Mr. Johnston as governor general, as like, see, all the liberals screw up governor general appointments, but we've got the best one. and He's the best Canadian you could have. He's the greatest Canadian icon. And on and on, and I'm talking like the Harper conservatives yeah. used to talk about David Johnston that way. And to see them basically ruin this man's reputation, because I think they had some legitimate arguments to make about the government's handling over foreign interference yeah. and questions to raise. But that, to me, was the... I would not have anticipated that this time yeah. last year. And he probably didn't either. Um, Chantel. Um, the, Justin Trudeau's carbon tax carve-out. Uh, this is a, a prime minister who fought three election campaigns, but especially the last two, on carbon pricing, went to the Supreme Court to defend the, the right of the federal government to do this. And then in, in a really neglectful approach, said, oh, gee, people, I'm going to advance the fight against climate change by go doing a carve-out for people who, do, who heat their homes with oil. Well. Um, he must have known that it would take, especially since he had as a backdrop his Atlantic MPs, he must have known it would take two seconds to connect Atlantic Canada, oil eating, and the sudden need for a carve out. Uh, and I thought it was the most back of the envelope move uh, that no one saw coming uh, from this government this year. And there were many others, but that one <laughs> just took that the That was prize. the best one, yeah. Uh, <laughs> Andrew. <laughs> Uh, the sudden widening of the gap between the Conservatives and the Liberals starting in June of this year. I mean, before then, they'd been locked in this sort of thing where one party was ahead yep. by two or three points, yep. but it was always pretty tight. And a lot of us were saying, you know, okay, you know, probably ever, you know, the people are discontented with the government, but they don't seem willing to place their support with the Conservatives. Well, bang, suddenly they went to a 14, 15, and even, I think, 18 or 19 point gap at its peak. Uh, we'll see whether that has started to reverse itself a little bit. Um, it doesn't seem to be connected to that advertising campaign and make, make him look no. touchy-feely. That was later. Or to Justin Trudeau's um, um, gaffe of saying, you know, housing isn't a federal responsibility. It may be connected to that last interest rate hike mm -hmm. uh, that was brought in. I guess it was in June. But for whatever reason, uh, um, um, it was a pretty pronounced gap by the end of the summer. Okay, we're going to do uh, who impressed you most with their leadership, but I'm going to do most and least in the same answer. I have a TBD for your least, so maybe <laughs> I hope you've come up with an answer. I'm going to start with you. So sure. impressed you most and least. Uh, impressed me most is Pierre Poilievre. Uh, I loathe in some ways to say it, but, uh, you know, when you get to 42% in the polls, uh, you've got to be doing something right. And he's clearly a very effective communicator. He was clearly right to get on top of the housing and affordability issue and really hammer that when the government was quite yeah. uh, complacent on it. Yeah. Uh, least impressive, Pierre Poilievre. <laughs> and this is the that thing. That might be cheating here. <laughs> no, but this is the thing. Just when they're riding high, yeah. he starts you know, playing to that same gallery that he likes to play to that is not Mr. and Mrs. Canada, that is uh, playing to the fringes and... and picking fights and all the things that it, it seems like it's just in him, he can't yeah. resist. And lo and behold, we're starting to see maybe some, some degree of pushback on, on those, uh, that polling success. Chantal, least, uh, least, most and least. Uh, most I went uh, with, I thought, because we don't get impressed by politicians. No, we we watch hard. them, yeah, we're yeah. interested in them, yeah. but uh, the, the, to be impressed is kind of a weird approach. So I went with someone who isn't on the scene anymore, Aaron O'Toole, who I thought uh, gave one of the best speeches mm -hmm. this year, his farewell speech, where he cautioned his colleagues uh, on the way out uh, about the fact that debate was being lost to the use of the House of Commons as a uh, a prop to for social media purposes yes. Yes. and the dangers of that. Uh, it was almost as if he was describing what you should do or shouldn't do to a successor who promptly decided to do exactly what is yep. uh, what Mr. O'Toole was uh, cautioning against. But I still believe that speech will endure much longer than most of the speeches yeah. we heard this year. Um, least. I was tempted to talk about your CBC president, but I over. A week has elapsed since then, and I will go with Pierre Poiliev for a very uh, strange reason. He won the fall. Andrew is right. But 
and then he went and through this, we're going to keep the house sitting till Christmas. Yeah. And to me, over the past two weeks, he has looked like the guy who goes to the casino, is having a great night, <laughs> but will not leave the table until he's lost his shirt. <laughs> uh, and, and I think if, you're, if you don't know when to call a win a win and yeah. take your, yeah. your winnings home, yeah. you have a problem. Okay, Althea. I think a lot of the conservative backbench might agree with uh, some of your assessments. Um, so I said impressed me the most with their leadership, the Liberal Caucus, for the reasons that Chantal outlined as a surprise. Um, I don't know if it's because of Justin Trudeau's declining numbers and the Liberals' disastrous summer, um, but the backbench has started to flex its muscle in a way that was promised back in 2015 mm -hmm. that never really materialized mm -hmm. but for a handful of maverick MPs. So you're having a backbench realize that they have more influence in using that. Whether or not you agree with the way they've used it, they have used it to get the carve out for not just Atlantic Canada, but mostly rural Canadians who heat with home uh, heating oil. They've used it to double the rural tax uh, carbon price credit um, or the pay incentive payments, I should say. Um, and they've used it also very recently on trying, well, convincing the government to change its vote at the United Nations with regards to the humanitarian ceasefire. And that would not have happened. Uh, were not for the backbench. Mm. And maybe it wouldn't even have happened if we didn't have the round-the-clock voting with the backbench having all that time with the Prime Minister. Amazing and, what and fear of losing <laughs> your seat. <laughs> yes, I was going to say. At, at least? Quickly. I went with François Legault. Oh, yes, okay. Yes. Because it has been... Uh, a very impressive decline uh, Probably, yeah. from, and we've talked about this on the program since the by-election lost in Jean Talon, but even before then, the reversal of on the uh, on the tunnel to Livy. Very recently, uh, with the news with the Anglophone universities in Montreal, he does not seem to have his pulse on yep. Quebecers' desire anymore, and the government seems to be really struggling making terrible decisions, whether it's health care, whether it's increasing uh, the salary of um, members of the National Assembly. Uh, people are not on site anymore. And we have this huge strike. I don't know by the time this airs if the strike will have been resolved, but um, he doesn't have the pulse on Quebecers mood anymore. OK, so we're off to a good start. We're going to leave it there for this round. We'll be back with more at issue. Up next, we'll look ahead to 2024 and the biggest political challenges. From the outcome of the U.S. presidential election to the Conservative Party's momentum and Justin Trudeau's own political future, a lot can shape the next year in Canadian politics. So what do you need to watch for in 2024? What are the biggest political challenges? Okay, let's bring everybody back. Chantal, Andrew and Althea all here with me in person for another round of our Year Ender. This is not crystal ball. That's not what I, because I know you all hate that. So that's not what you have to do here. But just uh, based on what we know, the kinds of things that we're going to watch for uh, in 2024. So let's start with the political leader or MP to watch for next year. Uh, it's a no-brainer that we need to watch Justin Trudeau, even if he says every uh, second minute that he's staying on. Uh, at some point in the calendar, if he's still there, uh, he will be staying. Yes. But he still has uh, time to change his mind. I don't know if he will, but one way or another, it's going to be interesting to watch. Yep. Andrew. Uh, his uh, partner in crime, <laughs> if you will, uh, Jagmeet Singh. Uh, who at some point uh, may or may not make a decision about whether he wants to continue with this supposedly ironclad agreement, which was always going to be hostage to, to political expedience. Sure. Um, if, the, if the Liberals stay where they are or go lower in the polls, he'll be sorely tempted to uh, pull the ripcord. Pierre Poilievre. Look at you guys, just all the three leaders there. <laughs> well, I mean, for the reasons I think Andrew outlined, is he going to rise to the occasion and be that prime minister in waiting, or is he going to play to the instincts, which are frat boy, uh, very hyper partisan? Um, I think that there has been a reality check uh, in December, November, and we'll see whether or not changes happen in the new year. And, and of those people that we just talked about, who has the most to lose? Oh, well, uh, well Pierre Poilievre, because he, he is way up uh, in the polls, it's going to be really hard for. Uh, Pierre Poilievre to sustain that lead for maybe 18 months yeah. uh, and, and to do so in a way that, um, you know, that 
one of the things that I think conservatives should pay attention to is that Mr. Poiliev is making enemies every second day. He's made more enemies in the Senate than he needs to. He's made more enemies of the other opposition party than he needed. He's making enemies of mayors of Canada's larger cities. But what if he fails? What if he wins but fails to deliver a majority? Mm. Who will he be talking to? And he's, he's burning more bridges than he's building. Uh, and I think over the past month and a half, the impression the Conservatives gave and their leader was that they've already won the election. Yes, yes. Yeah. Now, the last person who acted like that and the last team that yeah. acted like that was Paul Martin yeah. after he became leader of 55% yeah, in I, Quebec. I, yeah. uh, and they have not, you have not won the election until you've actually won it. I, I remember our old colleague Bruce Anderson's yes. line on election night 2015. He said, I don't think the Liberals would have won it if they hadn't started in third. One of the things that Justin Trudeau, obviously, and any liberal leader uh, has to guard against is looking arrogant, looking full of themselves. Uh, um, so if he'd come into that ahead, he might yeah. have really been in trouble. Yeah. Coming from behind, looking like the underdog, maybe this is the scenario that liberals are dreaming of in this case, yeah. but, but it can't be ruled out. Yeah, I do know people that have said to conservatives, stop measuring for courage. Oh, yeah. It's not time yet. The irony is that Mr. Poitiev has given that message to his caucus. <laughs> he just doesn't seem to have <laughs> taken his own advice. It's hard to take your own advice sometimes. Okay, biggest political challenge for 2024, Althea. Can the Liberals turn the tide? Basically the flip side of that question. Um, I don't know if they can. Does it mean a new leader? If it doesn't mean a new leader, what, what it? has to yeah. change? Yeah. Andrew. Uh, the US election in November, um, it's going to be a chaotic year. Uh, well, all kinds of things nobody can predict, but, <laughs> yeah. but more so I think than any election I can think of. If Donald Trump gets in, it's very clear that he's going to use that uh, office to seek retribution on his enemies, to try to exempt himself from the rule of law in terms of his own criminal charges, uh, uh, stack the whole government with his loyalists, uh, have the craziest people in MAGA around him. Um, there is real potential for a breakdown in political order in the United States, including well, political violence. Yeah, and, and potentially the world in terms yeah. of geopolitical well, that's stability, right? right? And we're, you're already <laughs> seeing a breakdown of the Pax Americana. Our adversaries, adversaries of the democratic West are already um, you know, making their moves uh, even now. Mm -hmm. uh, but imagine if they see America as divided and consumed as they are then, and the implications for Canada are profound. Yeah. Well, even the impact on politics in Canada is yes. but, yeah. Yeah. Uh, And I'll go with that too, because it, <laughs> Few events could impact the dynamics, the political dynamics in this country from outside as much as the yeah. American election. And I can't tell you how it would impact, but it would change the conversation. I also believe that the outcome of that election could have more consequences on our governance, regardless of who wins the next federal election, than just about anything that will happen between now and what do you mean election by that? night. I think if uh, uh, Trump comes back to the White House, the oxygen will be sucked out of the room of any Canadian government, conservative or liberal, just trying to figure out what happens when. I don't know where we would stand on Ukraine, uh, considering what's happening next door. Uh, what would a, an administration that has no interest in the rule of law do uh, to Canadians who are similarly inclined? Go down the list. The first Trump administration basically meant that the Trudeau government suddenly set its agenda aside to deal with Trump. Well, this is Trump 2.0 is nothing like the first time. Mm -hmm. It's much more complicated and much more risky for any federal government. And I am not sure that either party um, would be able to sustain a partisan stance in the face of that. Okay, stay with us. We'll be right back with one more round of our At Issue Year Ender. This time, we will discuss the political story that didn't get enough attention. That's next. Nice. Welcome back to our final round of our At Issue Year Ender. We've looked back on the year that was and ahead, and now we're going to talk about what didn't get enough attention this year because that generally happens with busy news cycles. Um, I'm, going to start with, I'm going to start with you, Andrew. What story didn't get the attention maybe it deserved? Uh, the extraordinary surge in assisted suicide cases. Uh, you know, when this was first brought in, of course, uh, we were all told, don't worry about it. It's going to be very limited. It's only going to be people in the last stages of an inexorable and an agonizing death. Uh, you know, we're not Belgium, we're not the Netherlands. Uh, this is slippery slope alarmism. Well, since then, the numbers have been skyrocketing, 30% per year. 
Um, the, the definition has been broadened and elasticized both by legislation and it seems by practice. We're hearing horrible stories of people going in and being told, well, we can't treat you for cancer, but have you considered assisted suicide? Uh, the genie is out of the bottle in this in a very alarming way, and I think people are starting to realize that. Yeah, it's true that you now, almost everyone, you would know someone who's done it now. It's, it's, it's beyond just someone you don't know. It's, it's someone you do know. Althea. To be clear, that's against the law. Somebody going to get cancer treatment and yes, being told. Yes, oh. yes, of course. Yeah. I'm not saying it doesn't happen. <laughs> I just don't yeah. want people to think that yeah. that's yeah. a okay. legal thing. Yeah. Um, so I would not say assisted suicide. That's probably because I've spent too much time writing about it. Uh, I am shocked that we still live in a country where there are communities that do not have clean drinking water. The thing with this, this question, the way you phrased it, is really interesting to me because when we do pay as a group, the media pays attention to an issue, the, peop the general public starts realizing that there is this problem and then that puts pressure on governments to do something about it. I feel like we have dropped the ball on the opioid crisis. Everybody is aware of it, but we have not covered it in a sustained way to encourage governments to do something about it, whether that's provincially or federally. I would say it's the same thing about defense spending. We're, we hardly talk about that. Maybe we will talk more about it if Donald Trump gets elected. <laughs> but um, I think there's so many issues, frankly, that could have been more covered this yeah. year that we didn't. I, I will say my colleagues at the House have done some excellent work covering they the did. opioid crisis. Yeah, yeah that's just to true. give them credit for that. Yeah, and maybe Althea is talking about the world where the media is in good shape and has more boots on the ground to cover all these stories, <laughs> also that, uh, yes. including on Parliament Hill. Um, the resurgence of the Parti Québécois, we all mm -hmm. talk, yeah. and Althea mentioned what's happening to François Legault, yes. but we, we, someone always benefits. Uh, in this case, it's the Parti Québécois. Uh, with well, I four don't seats. think most people could name the leader of the Parti Québécois. Except he's the most popular leader in Quebec. So but, it doesn't really but. matter to him that <laughs> most people couldn't name him outside the province. The fact is that um, there is a reason for that. It's not a sudden resurgence of sovereignty. It is that the Parti Québécois is the last party that governed Quebec uh, and that has a leader. The Quebec Liberals do not have a leader. They are lost in the wilderness. So when Quebecers think maybe we want to replace the CAC that the experience didn't work out, they look to a party that has actually been in government. That being said, the return of the PQ uh, combined with what's happening in Saskatchewan and Alberta with those autonomous mm -hmm. agendas, uh, could yield some interesting challenges for whoever is in government over the next five years. But people aren't drawn to the PQ because of sovereignty, you're saying. But no. sovereignty is still a, a no, critical they're, principle they're, for the PQ. Oh, yeah. They're, yeah. they're drawn to the PQ for now because they are the most natural alternative that they see. But uh, that doesn't mean that they will not be reinterested in sovereignty, that a federal government, As for result. instance, that they dislike intensely and that is not, it's a bit like an elephant in a china shop. Yeah. I'm not talking about Pierre Poilievre, but I am. <laughs> Could go a long way to make the PQ sovereignty agenda appealing again. But three years is a long time. Uh, it's going to be very long for the <laughs> Coalition Avenir Québec and François Legault, yes. But, but that does feel like something perhaps we should have more yes. of an eye on as a country, if that's going to be the well, direction because, it's going. Well, because it's happening at the same time as uh, those challenges yes. are coming from Alberta right. and Saskatchewan. Yes. So it's not happening and, in a vacuum. And, no. and the challenges that the CAQ has brought in. I mean, it, yes, you know, yes, it's, yes. It's, it's, the, 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 the constitutional order has yes. cracked. Yeah, a little bit. Okay. Thank you all for that. Appreciate it. Uh, and again, happy holidays. We'll see you back here next week for our last panel of the year. We're going to take your questions, some fewer questions, and get some answers from these guys for you. Uh, so we'll see you back here for that.